with me, please. Sovereign Lord, instruct my tongue that I may know the word that sustains the weary. Waken our ears to listen to your teaching. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Everyone talks about how important the Ten Commandments are, right? What's the first commandment? We have a couple of others. Well, it starts out by saying, I'm the Lord, but I heard someone back there, you shall have no other gods before me. Oh, for something so important. Okay, well, let's talk about that one. Let's talk about, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, don't let anything become an idol in your life. Because that's what an idol is. An idol is something that comes before God in your life. Something that is more important to you than God. Now, idol worship was a big problem back in the Old Testament days, but it still is today. It's just our idols look a little bit different from what they looked like back then. Now, before we talk about what Jeremiah had to say about idols, let's consider first about what an idol is, why we have them, and why we allow them to become idols in our lives. Idolatry shows up not just in what we do, but idol worship affects our mindsets and the values that kind of guide and control our lives. Now, these could be values that are good in, them, in themselves. They could even be blessed by God. But they become an idol when they become an end in itself, when they become what matters most of all. We lapse into idolatry when we allow something that is good to become the focus of our lives instead of God. For example, patriotism is good, right? But it becomes idolatry when it turns into nationalism. A desire for social justice is good, right? But it becomes an idol when you fall into what now is being called wokeism or wokeness. Defending our nation is a good thing, right? But when it turns into militarism, then it becomes a problem. And if I made you uncomfortable with any of those, we're going to get to that in a second. Here's one way to recognize an idol. Can you make a joke about it? Can you laugh at it? If not, then perhaps it is something you're taking too seriously. It might be something you're letting your life be based upon, and I can't make any jokes about that because that's just too important to me. Idolatry provides a story or an explanation for what your life is or what your life should be. Idolatry creates habits of action and it creates dispositions of our spirit that are based on its message. And that's what can lead to sinful actions and sinful attitudes. Idolatry tends to be powered by two things, by greed and by fear. And both greed and fear come from a failure of faith. So first of all, idolatry can come from greed. Greed means, I don't trust that God is going to provide for me. And so I have to hoard my resources. I'm going to trust in them to take care of me instead. And so many forms of idolatry are focused somehow on economics. Having money, getting money, saving early, saving money, earning money. And in fact, twice in the New Testament, idolatry is compared to greed. In Ephesians chapter 5, and in the passage we read together from Colossians, it talks about greed being the same thing as idolatry. In other words, a desire to having more than what your fair share is, and getting more and getting more and getting more. Because that more you want, that's become what's important in your life. The second thing that leads us into idolatry is fear. And again, that's a failure to trust God. A failure to trust that God will care for us and protect us. Idolatry is the mistaken belief that there's something else out there that will take care of us. It's the mistaken belief that God's not going to get us through and we need to look, we need to look for something else. The idol is something that says, trust in me instead. 
If you want to look at some examples of idolatry in our world around us, well, it's a little different for us. Back in Jeremiah's days, idols were like these literal statues that they'd make out of wood or gold and dress up and bow down to. We don't have too many of those, at least not specifically, but we have idols right now. Here's, a way, here's one way to find idols. Look at our advertising and our marketing around us. Sometimes when you're watching TV or driving and looking at billboards or surfing the internet, look at the ads, wherever, wherever those ads are hitting you, stop and look at them and ask yourself, is this appealing to my fear or to my greed? Because most of them are appealing to one or the other. Is this appealing to my fear? In other words, are they saying, hey, here's something we're offering that's going to take care of your problems for you? Whether it's leaves in your gutter or the latest health issue that you didn't even know you had. Or is the ad appealing to your greed, saying, here's something that's going to make your life better. If only you eat my food that I'm selling, then you're going to be so happy. Look at all these pictures of family... Have you ever noticed how many families sit around and smile while they're eating candy bars? You see it on TV all the time. That candy bar is going to make you happy. That's the greed part of idolatry. Now, we don't show up and say, hey, let's make some idols. Because idols are already around us. We are always surrounded by them. That's the world we live in. And they are clamoring for our allegiance and for our faith. Idol worship is the way things already are. So we don't set out saying, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to rebel against God and follow an idol instead. No, we're surrounded by these pressures to make us worship these idols. And sometimes we give in. Here's one of the ironic things about idolatry. Idolatry often emerges when God fulfills his promises and when God blesses us. Because when God blesses us, we are tempted to take our eyes off of God who gave us the blessing and instead look at the blessing, the benefits that he gives, and we think, well, that's what's taking care of me. That's what really matters, rather than the God who gave it to us. And so we forget our need and our dependence on God because we believe our blessings have come from these idols, or we turn God's blessings into idols. But it's not much better when God's blessings seem to be few and far between. Because if we don't feel like God is blessing us, then we think, well, God's failed me. Maybe he's not the almighty Lord of the universe after all. Maybe I need to look somewhere else for something to take care of me and fulfill my life. And remember earlier when I gave some examples of good things that could become idols, it is really easy to identify someone else's idol. I bet whenever I gave some of those examples, you thought, oh, I know people like that. I know some people who they just are taking things way too seriously and they're taking it way too far. They are worshiping an idol. It's really easy to see it when someone else is doing it, right? But what about your own idols. If you got a little bit uncomfortable with some things, or maybe, it, maybe I'm way off base. I will admit that before anyone else. But it is much more difficult to identify your own idols. It's really easy to see them in someone else. But it doesn't matter if you see it in someone else, because you can't confront it there. You have to confront the idols in your own life. You have to put those things back in their proper place, meaning not ahead of God, but behind God. And by the way, we Christians and we churches, we are not immune to idol worship because we face those same forces. Remember I said idolatry comes from fear and greed? Well, let me ask you, how do you think greed could affect a church, the life of a church? How could a church fall into Greed leading what we're doing. Misusing our money. Hey, let's build a nice, big, beautiful church with the money people are giving. So everyone says, oh, look at that nice church there on Union Church Road. Doesn't have to be that. It could be we want our church to be bigger than the other churches. We want to be the better church in the neighborhood. We want people to notice us. We want our church to be what is really big and important. That's idolatry. How about fear? 
How can fear affect the life of a church and lead us into idolatry? Mitchell? Not trusting other uh, people to worship alongside us. That's a really good example. Not trusting the other people who are worshiping alongside of us. Maybe either they're not going to be there at all, or can I really count on these people who are around me? Are they really going to be there when the chips fall down? But there's other ways also. Sometimes fear can grip the life of a church, and we, we just think, what can we do to make sure our church doesn't close? What can we do to make sure that we have enough people in our church? What can we do to make sure we have enough money in our church? Because we're afraid we're going to lose it, and so we turn things that will make sure we have enough money as a church into what we're all about instead of God. Do you get my point here? It is so easy to fall into idolatry. All right, now let's turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet during the final years of the kingdom of Judah, which is also sometimes called the southern kingdom. Judah was this little country that was wedged between the mighty empires of Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. And it would be very easy to see how this little kingdom could be dominated by fear. Because the Assyrians up to the north, they'd already overrun a whole bunch of the other kingdoms around them. And so they figure it's just a matter of time till one of these big bullies shows up at our doorstep and wipes us out. So it's easy to see how they would be afraid. And let's look for something that will protect us from these enemies. But they were also gripped in greed. Greed, by the way, seems to be a constant presence in human society. In Judah's case, in the days of uh, Jeremiah, the nation suffered from corruption and injustice at the highest levels, both government leaders and religious leaders. They were all about using the power that they had to take from other people. And don't we still see that today, by the way? People who have the ability to take from others are more than happy to do so. So this is what the kingdom was like in Jeremiah's time. So it's understandable for them to think that the Lord wasn't any help. So let's turn elsewhere. Let's find someone or something else to take care of us. Because if the Lord really is the God of all creation, then why are we his people, simply these little pawns in the world landscape? And... If I go to the temple to seek the Lord, and all I see there are a bunch of greedy priests who are milking us for all that it's worth, why should I even bother worshiping a God whose priests are like that? Maybe we should worship the gods of these nations around us because they're so powerful. Maybe, maybe we should worship the Assyrian gods or the Egyptian gods because those gods seem to have made their countries pretty powerful, right? It makes pretty, that makes a lot of sense. Jeremiah and his fellow prophets must have felt like they were swimming upstream. They had to go against the flow because the most natural thing, and it's still true today, the most natural thing in the world is to find and follow an idol that seems powerful, that seems it can fulfill our greed and can save us from our fear. And we have to swim against the current in order to say, wait a minute, that's not true. There is a God in heaven, and he is the one that we keep above all else. We need constantly to hear Jeremiah's reminder of how truly powerful the Lord is. Like, for example, in verse 10 of what Mary read for, Mary Ray read for us. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. He created everything that there is, and he controls the world. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe that God created all that there is and he controls the world? But sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that. Because there's these, all these other things around us that seem to be so powerful. But Jeremiah reminds us, all these other gods that seem to be mighty, they have no power at all. They will vanish away. They are mere illusions that will fade. The Lord... Jeremiah said, the Lord is the portion of Jacob. In other words, he is the one who provides for his people. Colossians, the passage that we read together, provides us another reason to turn from idolatry. 
Colossians tells us that our life is now hidden in Christ. This is the Sunday after Easter. He is risen. risen All right. You can tell your pastor friend I did that, Mary, or I see if it works or not. No, Christ is risen, and we now share his resurrection life. That means we have lost our old way of life. We are now dead to an earthly, worldly focused life. That is no longer who we are. When we receive the new life of Christ, that life has been put to death. But as long as we live in that old way of life, in that way of life where we're seeking after other things other than God to keep us happy, we're digging up corpses. And we're being like Dr. Frankenstein, trying to bring his monster to life. We're trying to resurrect what Christ has put to death. Not resurrect, that's the wrong word to use. We're trying to resuscitate and bring back to life what Christ has put to death because now our life is hidden in him. God is the one who continually renews and remakes us. He, the, he who provides, provides all that is sufficient. Where are you focusing your energy and your hope? Okay, so here's two antidotes. If you're wondering, so what do we do about this? Here's two antidotes to idolatry, two things resources that we have to make sure we keep God first and don't let anything else get there. The first one is the Sabbath. The Sabbath means setting boundaries and setting limits to our desires. The Sabbath means saying, this is enough. I have enough. I don't need to work on that seventh day of the week to get more and more and more. I don't need to keep working for fear that things won't get done. Take the Sabbath. It is the chance to say, what God has provided is enough, and I can pause and thank him for it. The second antidote is mission and generosity. Forcing yourself to relinquish what could be your idol, to relinquish what you're holding on to out of greed or fear, to open up that tight grip and say, here, I'll give it to someone else. It can be really hard. But it is a way to remind ourselves that God and God alone is the one who provides. This is one of the reasons why we have offering as part of our worship service. Yeah, since the days of COVID, we're not passing the offering plates. They're in the back. You can put the money in on your way in or on your way out. But we still have a time of offering during worship as a reminder for us that we are surrendering our idols we are surrendering anything else in our lives that might threaten God's primary place in our lives and saying, God, I'm letting it go. I'm releasing it and giving it to you. Remember that salvation, including being delivered from our idols, salvation cannot come from within. It comes from God who works within us. So we need the Holy Spirit to form healthy faithful practices and attitudes. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides us ways to resist idolatry. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides the desire to resist idolatry. The Holy Spirit is the one who provides us the ability to recognize the idols of our life in the first place. You shall have no other gods before the Lord. Is that something you think you can work on? No, it's something I need to work on. Let's pray. Lord God, our desire is to have you and you alone as the Lord of our lives. So save us, Lord, from the idols around us and be at work within us so that we can claim you and you alone as the Lord of our lives. Amen.